So my name is Dan Sugar. I am a professor in the uh, Department of Earth, Energy, and Environment, and I'm also the director of the Environmental Science Program here at the University of Calgary. It's wonderful to have so many of you here in person as well as online from around the world for tonight's EarthX series talk featuring Dr. Eric Steig. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're super excited to have you with us. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, tonight's Q&A session, which will occur after the talk, um, will include section, um, questions both from our online audience as well as from here in the room. And if you're joining us online, um, I'm going to very quickly say the number you can text now, but we'll show that at the end as well, 403-708-5749. Uh, and I'll repeat that, we will put that on the screen at the end of the talk so that you can text in your, uh, your questions. And as we begin tonight's, um, tonight's event, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we live, work, and learn on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region. And this includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Gainai First Nations, as well as the, the Tsutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. We also acknowledge that we're standing on land that is situated immediately adjacent to the Bow River, a river that has shaped this land and its people for generations. The traditional Blackfoot name for the Bow River is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Since 2015, uh, the Department of Earth, Energy, and Environment, or as it was previously called, the Department of Geoscience, has, been, has had the pleasure of organizing um, what we called the Gallagher Colloquium Lecture Series, or now what we call EarthX. And these presentations have allowed our department, as well as the Faculty of Science, uh, to welcome and host world-class researchers who share a passion for scientific research and exploration, as you'll see in a few minutes. And so I'd like to take a moment to recognize um, the, the Gallagher family for making this series possible through their generosity and their vision for the deep connections between the university and the community. And the Gallaghers are long-standing champions of access to earth science for everybody, and their support allows us to promote and build awareness for science and scientific research and help people understand why science is fundamental and important not only to our own lives, but to the planet and the world that we all share. So we're grateful to host this uh, important lecture series, and I'd like to now um, welcome Dr. Kristen Bates, Dean of the Faculty of Science, to say a few words about this department. Thank you, Dan. So as uh, Dan said, I am Kristen Bates. I am Dean of the Faculty of Science, and it's such a pleasure to be here tonight and to be in a community that is so interested in earth science. Here we have with us today members of the community, alumni, present faculty and staff, our present students, and we also have some future students here who are out to learn a little bit more about our new and I think truly amazing uh, new department of Earth, Energy and Environment, and to learn about what is science? What are we exploring? What what wonders are out there in the world? So for all those future students or anybody who's interested in potentially switching, because I know there's a lot of biologists who came here tonight, into uh, environmental science or geoscience, uh, please note that there are, is an amazing booth at the back and Annie, she'll wave for us. She can answer all your questions. This is also an amazing time and I saw quite a few students who were looking for research opportunities this summer and field work. And in the audience, there are tons of our geoscience faculty and a few people from industry here. So I encourage all our students to spend some time here networking. So as I said, and Dan has said, here at University of Calgary, we are committing, committed to thinking big and doing big things and doing them differently. That's who we are as Calgarians. And that embodies the spirit of our new department of earth, energy, and environment. And everything we do reflects that. This department is unique in all of Canada. There is no other group that is combining these areas with a kind of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity that focuses on solving some of the greatest challenges of our generation. From changing climate, to securing water and energy supply, to unraveling just the mysteries of our planet. 
we've brought all these research threads together into one unit because you need a transdisciplinary approach to really answer these great challenges. And we also know we work best, we make the best discoveries when we collaborate with each other. We bring different people, different teams, different perspectives all together to answer these great questions. And that's the kind of science that's going to solve all of our great challenges that we face. And that's the science that we are getting done today in the Faculty of Science. Our department is also home to the largest cohort of earth and environmental science students in Canada. And here in Calgary, those students have access to one of the greatest natural labs in the world, the Rocky Mountains, the prairies, the badlands, you name it, we have it. On top of that, we're in an amazing, thriving city of Calgary. A city whose success was built on science and technology and its future success is booming right now. And that drive, that entrepreneurship, that energy that is Calgary is based on science and technology. The opportunities here are endless. We work hard to bring our students a variety of perspectives and ideas and in the spirit of scientific collaboration. We want our students to be able to work with everyone, from industry and government to leading researchers, and exposing them to leading researchers from around the world, which is what EarthX series aims to do. This is why this event is so important to us. It gives us access to new ideas and new perspectives, and that is going to help every single one of us open our eyes to answering amazing problems. So with that note, I invite Dan back to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome uh, this evening's EarthX Earth speaker, Dr. Eric Steig. Uh, Eric is a professor and the chair of the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. He earned his PhD also at the University of Washington in 1996 and was involved in research and teaching in Colorado and Pennsylvania before returning to Washington State in 2001. And he focuses on climate and ice sheets and uses a, a combination of isotope geochemistry and climate modeling. And one of the things that is, I think, exciting about the work that Eric does is, um, is how hands-on that, that work can be. His primary observation tool or medium is the ice itself, uh, which, he uses, or, which he obtains by drilling cores into ice sheets and glaciers, um, which are then analyzed in his lab in Seattle. And this means going to some amazing locations, seeing some of our world's most unique, um, unique sites, to the far-flung reaches of the world, um, as well as, as much closer to home here in uh, Western Canada. And so he and his students are pioneers in the analysis of these ice cores using a variety of tools, isotope um, ratio mass spectrometry, for example, laser spectroscopy, often with instruments that he and his um, research team have actually designed themselves. In 2019, in recognition of his achievements in polar climate and glaciology research, um, as well as for being an early innovator in um, science communication, especially about climate change. Dr. Steig was honored as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And then just a few weeks ago, he was elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union for his fundamental contributions to ice core, paleoclimate, and climate dynamics research. So for tonight's talk, uh, let's see a show of hands. How many of you know that glaciers are melting? How many of you don't know that? All right, good. So this is an important issue. This is in the news probably on a weekly basis. In fact, on the bus in today, I was reading a New York Times article about a new paper about melting in Greenland. We all know that this is occurring, but what's often, or as is often the case in, in science, sometimes the reasons that things happen are not quite as obvious as they might appear at first glance. And so in order to find solutions to many of our world's greatest problems, first we need to understand these systems um, at, a, at a very deep level. And so to hear, to share his research and insights, Dr. Eric Steig with his EarthX talk, Antarctica is melting, but why now?
Thanks very much, Dan. Thank you all for coming. I'm honored to be here uh, back in my native Canada. I've actually never been to Calgary before. Um, I grew up in Vancouver and my mom would always say, why go anywhere? It's so beautiful here. But lately I've been getting out a bit more. I was in Edmonton earlier this year and I hadn't been there before. Actually, I had once. Um, so I, you know, I'm a scientist and what you're gonna hear from me tonight, I hope I'll be clear, but we don't know all the answers to all of these things and I'm, I'm also a pretty conservative person when it comes to science, that is, not politics necessarily. Um, and so I am careful not to, I hope I'm careful not to sort of do the doomsday thing. I think the doomsday way that you often hear people talk about climate change is, is not very productive. Uh, having said that, climate change is a serious issue and we need to understand it as Dan, I think, put it very well. I just realized that, oh, there it is, okay, good. So um, I'll just start off by, by saying that uh, this, um, I've forgotten how to use this thing. You have to think carefully. Oh, actually, it's not working, guys. Am I holding it backwards? <laughs> right, that, that's what's not working. It probably doesn't matter, actually. Um, okay, sorry, trouble with the pointer. This. Um, this uh, uh, background here is actually painted by a friend of mine who was in Antarctica, and I think it really captures very beautifully the kind of grandeur and beauty of Antarctica, and actually captures some of the science as well. Okay, so um, I'm gonna try to uh, capture four acts, as I call them, about Antarctica uh, to, to get across the point that it's not simple, as, as Dan already said. Some of it's simple and some of it's more complicated. And if you stick around to the end, you get to hear a bit about octopuses, octopi. Um, I was excited to see that Rachel Lauer, who gave the talk in November for the EarthX, uh, talked about octopus, octopi. <laughs> so um, before I, I move on with these acts, I just wanna introduce Antarctica a little bit. I'm sure everyone knows where it is. Uh, but just to orient you a bit, um, you know, here's a map of, of Antarctica surrounded by the Southern Ocean on the left. Uh, is South America, on the right is Australia. Um, on the upper left is the Antarctic Peninsula, and I'll, I'll talk about that first. Uh, this is just zooming in a bit, and I want to note something um, that's useful. The way that we orient Antarctica in the sort of traditional British maps has, of course, England to straight up there. <laughs> that's the prime meridian. And West Antarctica is to the left in the Western Hemisphere, East Antarctica is to the right. It has nothing to do with directions, right? Because everything's south or north, depending on where, which way you're facing. Those are the only two directions you've got. Um, West Antarctica and East Antarctica are separated by the Transantarctic Mountains. And essentially all of Antarctica is covered by ice, with the exception of some small areas that you can see in brown. Um, and we talk about the Antarctic ice sheet, but there's really two large ice sheets, which are just really, really big glaciers covering a lot of the landscape. The West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet. Just zooming in a little more, this is a, a high resolution digital elevation model. It actually looks pretty much like this from satellites. It's pretty white, uh, it's covered in ice. And these are the, the primary areas of Antarctica that I'll kind of mention. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula on the left, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and the East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, I'll also use the term ice shelf quite a bit. An ice shelf is a floating glacier. So the ice flows off the land, it goes onto the sea and it begins to float. Um, and those two ice shelves that are shown there are very, very large. I'm not gonna talk about them much because they're not changing a whole lot. There are other smaller ice shelves elsewhere. Um, this map shows an image of the velocity, the, the speed of the ice as it flows towards the sea. It's really beautiful satellite-based calculations. And uh, you can see the, the purple and red are the faster flowing areas. And when we talk about glaciers in Antarctica, we're usually talking about part of the ice sheet that's flowing faster than the surrounding. So it's a glacier, you know, glaciers in the Rockies are surrounded by rock. Glaciers here are bounded by slower moving ice. These are sometimes called ice streams as well. 
So here's a visual um, of the margin of the ice sheet with an ice shelf that's about 200 meters high above the floating sea ice uh, in front. The sea ice is frozen ocean surface. The ice shelf is a glacier, so it's snow that has fallen on the land, accumulated into, into an ice sheet, and then flowed down towards the sea. So it's floating, and you can go under that ice. I don't recommend it, but we send instruments under it. So before I go on, I want to just add one more thing, which is um, what is an ice core? And I've probably said this better here than, uh, than I will if I just ad lib. So I'm just going to run this short movie, which hopefully will work. Yes. An ice core is a continuous section of ice drilled into a glacier or an ice sheet. We're sending this instrument down, which is just a cutting tool. And the thing goes down a meter at a time. You bring it up, and now you have these long tubes of ice. Drilling an ice core is kind of like a time machine. You can go back and find out what was the atmosphere like 50,000 years ago. It's snow that has fallen, and it then is compressed trapping the atmosphere. You can count the layers in ice cores like you can count tree rings. And that means that you can actually determine when certain events in climate happened within a few years. So there were seven of us who went down to Hercules Dome in Antarctica this past winter, driving radar around looking for a place to drill an ice core. Since we put so much time and so much money just to get there, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that it is successful and that we have data to show for it. I think it's exciting to be a part of such a large question that hasn't been answered yet that could affect so many people's lives. Okay, so act one. That last bit of the video was in part to just remind me of the importance of the people I work with. Uh, Gemma, who just spoke here, was a graduate student of mine who, who finished her PhD recently. She's now doing a postdoc in oceanography. And a lot of what I've learned that'll be in this talk is actually from working with her. Um, and it's been really fun to get to send students off to the field and go into the field with them. So act one, the Antarctic Peninsula. This is the simple part. It's warmer, so it's melting. You can go home now. <laughs> um, this is actually mostly my excuse to show some beautiful pictures of the Antarctic Peninsula. When you think about Antarctica from National Geographic pictures, or if you're rich and you've been there, the Antarctic Peninsula is where people go because it's further north. You can take a boat from South America. It's relatively easy to get to. In fact, I have a friend that sailed his boat there. He's crazy, but he did make it home. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's coastal. This is where the whales and the seals and the penguins are. Um, these are all photos taken by a former student of mine who's now at the University of Colorado. There's a tall ship there. Looks almost like the 19th century, except it's in color. Penguins, you know, absolutely spectacular place. I have had the good fortune of, of being to this area, but uh, most of my science doesn't take place here. So a little bit about what's going on in the Antarctic Peninsula. I, I love this, this story. In 1842, James Clark Ross, after whom the Ross Ice Shelf and Ross Island and James Ross Island are named, um, tried to travel into this place, Admiralty Sound. He actually named it Admiralty Inlet because it seemed like it ended. It ended in a large white mass, which was a floating ice shelf. Um, Coburn Island is on the left. James Ross Island is on the right. Well, I've been here in a boat, and we've sailed right through here. So that ice is gone, and in fact, that ice disappeared in 1995, if I remember the year right. So it was like that for hundreds, probably thousands of years, and something changed in the very recent past. That's Coburn Island again on the left. Here's a map showing this area. Um, Coburn Island shown in blue there, and the location of Ross's ships in 1842 in Admiralty Sound is just, just below that. That's where they couldn't get through, and you can now take a ship through there. Not all the time, because there's still ice breaking off glaciers, floating around, getting in your way. There's sea ice building, but it's no longer a hundreds of meters thick floating glacier. Um, on the left is Prince Gustav Channel, which was completely filled with glacier ice until 1995. You can also take a ship in there, although there's a lot of ice left, sort of not all evacuated yet, so it's not highly recommended. Uh, 
two of these floating ice shelves, relatively small ones in the scheme of things, uh, the Larsen A and the Larsen B, disintegrated in 1995 and in 2002. Uh, and the map has actually changed. If you, if you buy a map from 20 years ago, 30 years ago of Antarctica, it'll show these ice shelves and they're no longer there. Um, we have some really great information about the climate history at this site because colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey drilled an ice core at the top of James Ross Island um, in 2011 or so, I think it was. Uh, that's a shot I took of the, of the location. I was down on the beach looking for fossils, actually, and we found some. Um, and the ice core site was drilled up there at 1,600 meters elevation. So this is the results from this ice core. Now, I am not going to go into any details here. I will just say for those that know or care about these details, uh, the upper plot is the oxygen isotope ratios of this ice core. Uh, but it, this is a proxy, a way to get at temperature history. And you can see that in the last 1,000 years, it's temperatures have gone up and down, but in the last century or so, they've warmed up. That's somewhat compelling, but much more compelling is the, the bottom plot which shows the fraction of melt in the ice core. So you drill into this old compressed snow that has mostly fallen at cold temperatures and is dry. But in the summer, you, you'll get melting at the surface and it'll form a little layer of ice. And then a thousand years later, that layer of ice is still preserved in the core. And you can just count like what fraction of this ice has clearly melted and no longer has bubbles in it and no longer looks like snow? And the answer is, well, it's gone up to 6% in the last century. This means definitively that it's warmer now in summer at this location than it has been for 1,000 years. And it's no surprise that it's at that same time that these ice shelves collapsed, because what's happened is meltwater has pulled on the surface, made its way down through the ice, and sort of cracked it apart. This just gives an illustration of what this looks like. This is actually from an ice core we drilled on Mount Waddington in British Columbia uh, this summer. But you can see this sort of snow-like white layer and then the very uh, thick melt layer. Because of course, in BC, it's not Antarctica. It's sunny and warm in the summer. Uh, there are forest fires as well that are probably recorded in this core. OK, so as I said, it's relatively simple in the Antarctic Peninsula. It's warmer air temperatures, so things are melting. No surprise. West Antarctica is way more complex. The West Antarctic ice sheet is not melting from above. It's Antarctica, it's cold. Even in the summer, it's very rarely above freezing. What's happening instead is water, warm ocean water is melting the ice from below. It's melting these floating ice shelves. To get a sense of how big the Antarctic ice sheet is, I'm just going to show you a few pictures from our work high on the Antarctic Plateau, thousands of kilometers from the locations that are melting, and then we'll kind of drive down towards the coast. It's flat and white. It's nothing like the Antarctic Peninsula. It's nothing like those penguin pictures that you see. It's very boring, but it's also really exciting. Uh, you can see these little tiny dots, which are our field camp, and then this is the runway for the, for the airplane. Um, there's one of the planes, good Canadian, Ken Boric, uh, Twin Otter taking us out into the field. And when you walk a few, drive a few kilometers away on the snowmobile, that's what it looks like. You could get lost really easily if the fog came in, which it does. So we have GPS units. There's one of our team driving a snowmobile. What we're doing here is driving around the ice, as Gemma said, I think, in that video, collecting radar data, looking down into the ice to measure its depth. OK, as you, as you leave the polar plateau, you fly for several hours in a big military transport plane or, or that twin otter plane. And you'll start to get to the edge of the ice sheet where it's breaking up. So these are huge crevasses. The scale is extremely hard to imagine here, but that plane would easily fit in these crevasses. And where we're going is towards Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers, which you've perhaps heard in the news, the Doomsday Glacier, that's Thwaites Glacier. It's changing rapidly, and I'm going to talk here about why that is. So this short video will just zoom into this area. The amoeba-like stuff is sea ice, floating uh, ocean, frozen ocean. And here's uh, an image of the velocity of the flow of the ice into the sea at these two glaciers. 
And this NASA uh, illustration is just illustrating that they've sped up in the last couple of decades. And they've become thinner, which is illustrated by the, the reddening color of the ice. OK, so why are those glaciers increasing in speed and thinning? It's because the ice shelves that sort of hold them back are getting thinner because warm water uh, is melting them from below. And we know that from a variety of measurements and modeling, et cetera, it's been well established over the years. Uh, one of the newest things is actually uh, really fantastic sub-ice submarines that go and measure the temperature and the salinity and other properties of the ice. This is a, a schematic of sort of what this looks like and what the important processes are. But the main thing that I want to draw your attention to, and I'll talk about this at, at a bit more length, is that the ocean in Antarctica is weird. It's cold at the surface, unsurprisingly. It's Antarctica. It's warmer below. Warm water actually travels all the way from the North Atlantic Ocean down through the Atlantic. It upwells around Antarctica, and it spins around Antarctica, so it's called circumpolar deep water. And what drives the upwelling of that warm water is the wind field around Antarctica. So the long and the short of it is that variations in the winds cause variations in the effectiveness of the flow of that warm water up under the ice shelves. Unsurprisingly, given what I just said, Ice shelf melting is greatest where circumpolar deep water is near the coast. So you can see the map of Antarctica here. The red uh, little uh, red areas are, are the rate of change of the thickness of the, of the thinning rate of the, uh, of the ice shelves. And the pink versus blue is the temperature of the water. It's still not very warm water. It's just plus one or two degrees Celsius. But that's above the melting point of ice. In fact, it's quite a lot above the melting point of ice because at pressure, that melting point is lower. This shows the same thing, but now it's showing, again, the thinning rate of the glaciers behind those ice shelves up, up on the land. And same thing, West Antarctica where, is where the action is happening. And you can see the Antarctic Peninsula up on the left there. There's some red there, too, but it's not as deeply red as in West Antarctica. So if I zoom in now to this particular region where these two large glaciers, Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites, are rapidly thinning and speeding up, and we look at a plan view of the bathymetry that is the depth to the ocean floor, the blue is the very deep ocean, and the yellow is the continental shelf. So it's deep, but it's not as deep as the deep ocean. And the critical process here is the circumpolar deep water that's surrounding Antarctica in that deep ocean, lapping up onto that continental shelf and making its way down these deep troughs, shown in blue on the lower right there, uh, and getting under the ice shelves. The next picture sort of illustrates this. This is uh, the temperature of the water at whatever depth happens to be the warmest water. So you picture going into that map and just going downwards until you record the warmest temperature and plot it on the map. So you can see the red, that's circumpolar deep water. You can see the blue, that's more surface waters. And you can see the circumpolar deep water making its way down, down the slide uh, towards the glaciers, which are on the bottom. This is the side view of the same thing. Cold water at the top, warm water at the bottom. The warm water, if it's just temperature, it should be less dense than the cold water, and it should float to the top, right? But that warm water is very salty. So it's actually denser, and that's how you can maintain this stratification. On the right shows the Pine Island Glacier ice shelf. And you can see that that circumpolar deep water in this particular set of data has made its way under the shelf. And it has a temperature relative to the in situ melting point of ice of somewhere around 2 and a half or 3 degrees Celsius, which is hot. Each additional degree Celsius of warming allows you to melt an additional 10 meters per year of ice vertically. How much warm water gets to the ice, I already said this, but this illustrates it, depends on how the winds which are pushing the ocean currents around vary from year to year. And there's some really wonderful data from back in the late 2000s uh, where we sort of expected this, but this was a, a real discovery. 2009 looked like this. 2012 looked like that, and possibly I can flip back and forth. 
you can see that the circumpolar deep water is getting deeper. So 2012 is a year in which less circumpolar deep water made it up onto the shelf and under the ice shelf, so less melting occurred. And it turns out that 2012 was a big La Nina event. Suddenly I'm talking about the tropics. Why? Well, you hear about El Nino all the time because of like the snow skiing is bad this year because of El Nino. Antarctica is at the tail end of circulation systems that begin in the tropical Pacific, just as Southern California and British Columbia and Alberta are affected by El Nino, so is Antarctica. Um, that's a typical pattern of La Nina when the tropical oceans are cold and the winds around Antarctica are different in La Nina years. This little video really illustrates this nicely. Note West Antarctica at the bottom, and this is, this is actually a simulation, but satellite photos look very similar. Uh, it's showing tropical clouds convecting, raining. Whenever it rains, the, the simulation shows red colors. And you can just see the, the Earth's atmospheric circulation system operating over the course of days. And there are these sort of tendrils of moisture that head towards Antarctica and give you a really nice illustration of the variability in the winds that are experienced along the coastline of Antarctica. Once in a while, you'll see a big storm sort of hit the coast there, like right there. And I've been there, not that close to the coast, when one of these things hits, and it's not fun. Staying in the tent for three days with 100 miles an hour winds is uh, actually not my favorite thing to do. OK, so the tropics in West Antarctica are connected. This is part of the complication, right? El Nino is a naturally occurring variation, and it's the biggest thing that causes variations in the winds, and therefore it's the biggest thing that causes variations in the rate of melting in those Antarctic glaciers. Discerning the long-term impact of human activities in the midst of all that kind of natural noise is actually really hard. Okay, but the punchline will be, yeah, but they are changing, and we, we actually know that now. Nice shot of a windy day in Antarctica. Okay, so Act Two was it's melting from below because the winds are pushing the warm water up against the ice. But the question we want to ask is, okay, but it really seems to be melting a lot now. <laughs> what has changed? Probably the winds have changed. So we set out many years ago to kind of try to figure that out. And this is where the ice core research come in. Back in the 90s, actually, we began drilling ice cores all over West Antarctica. Remarkably, there is one weather station in West Antarctica, just one, still. There's a, there's a couple that sort of turn on and off, but they get blown over. There's one operational weather station that has continually gotten data for us, temperature, winds, et cetera, since 1957. We have far more information about the climate of Antarctica from these ice core records. They're spread out all over the place. And that's, this is an old map. We actually have quite a few more now. Um, this illustrates kind of the, the relative time coverage. On the right, so this goes from 1800 to 20, 2005, uh, only because I haven't updated it. And the one weather station record is shown on the, on, on the, on the top there. And the average of all of these ice cores and the temperature estimate we get from those ice cores from the oxygen-18 concentrations is shown below. It's a much longer record, and as I've already alluded to, it shows a lot of variation. And in fact, every single high peak in that record turns out to be a known El Nino event. The tropics really dominate the variability of the climate and the ice sheet in Antarctica. 1940s, it's actually 1939 to 42, there was a really big El Nino event, the largest of the 20th century, possibly the largest of the last few centuries. Colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey drilled in a, a, a sediment core. They actually drilled through the ice and into the sediment and dated the age at which the ice used to be sitting right on that sediment. And the answer is it lifted off that sediment around 1940. They said 1945 plus or minus five. That's good enough for me. It's probably the same event. So this is just another piece of evidence that highly variable winds cause changes in what happens to the Antarctic glaciers. Okay, now I'm gonna 
brush through my entire, my student gentleman's entire PhD thesis and several papers and just say, trust us, I'll send you the papers if you want. It's somewhat complex, it's not deeply complex to understand, but I don't want to go into it. We have these wonderful ice core records that tell us something about climate change and variability in the past. We have climate models that are just models, but they're pretty good models. And what Gemma did is combine the two of them and constrain the free running climate model with observational data from ice cores and actually other records as well, including corals from the tropical Pacific. And she made an estimate of the wind change around Antarctica over the last century. And the different colors are just different versions of this calculation using different climate models. The black shows modern observations. And what you see is there is variation, just like there is in the ice cores, but there's also a long-term trend. The winds are getting stronger around Antarctica. And there's a bunch of other independent evidence to support this as well, but ours is the best. <laughs> I really do believe that. Um, Gemma also made maps of the pattern on the left of sea level pressure and of the strength of the westerlies using as different models. And don't worry about the details. The point is that now we have a statistical estimate constrained by data of what the pattern of winds and other climate variables has looked like for the last century. This is the power of getting ice core data you can go back in time. Colleagues at the university at the British Antarctic Survey took essentially her results and used them to drive a numerical computer model of ocean circulation in this region of Antarctica. And they found, yeah, those changes in the winds should have driven increased heat fluxes, increased heating from the deep ocean down the troughs towards the glaciers. And I apologize for the not all that useful units, 400 uh, kilowatts per meter squared per century changes. Um, it's about a half a degree of warming that they estimate has occurred in this area over the last century. And again, half a degree gives you an extra five meters of melt per year. That's enough to matter. So we think we basically understand what's going on here. But it's a small signal, it depends on statistical measures, it depends on climate models, it's not a direct observation, and the signal's pretty small. So keep that in mind. I'm not 100% sure about this, pretty sure, but we will see. Um, okay, so end of act three is the ice is melting from below. It seems that the wind, well, the winds have changed in such a way that that melting should have increased. So we think we basically understand why Antarctica has been melting and thinning in the last century. Are those wind changes due to human activities? I think so, I'm not sure. I'm not actually gonna strongly make that case today. I'm usually wrong when I say these conservative things, but I like to be careful because I don't know for sure. Okay, so implications for the future, right? The only way we can be sure that projections of the future have any bearing on reality, because the future hasn't happened yet, is by comparing with a test in the past, which has happened and we have some information on. So all of that stuff I just talked about is sort of like, do we know what's happening and can we match what we know against the observations? Does it make sense? Does it hold together? Pretty well, and so let's use that information to uh, go forward in time. So again, my colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey have done this. Now they don't have data, they just have models, but they're simulating the future in the same way that they successfully simulated the past. And they find that, yeah, that part of Antarctica, the Amundsen Sea where these, these glaciers are, is going to warm up in the future. I think a critical point is look how light the colors are in the upper part. They're, they're not arguing that circumpolar deep water is getting warmer. It's already warm. It's all about whether more of it can get up onto the ice shelves, uh, onto the continental shelf and under the ice shelves and, and heat those ice shelves more. And this says if we continue on the trajectory we're on, the so-called two degree scenario, Paris two degree, you know, the, the hope that we keep global warming to less than two degrees, um, uh, that's how much warming we can expect in this part of, of West Antarctica. So here's a plot of the same data 
as a time series that I showed you a few slides ago as a, as a, uh, as a map. This is a hindcast. This is what we think happened since 1920. There's a little bit of a trend and there's a lot of variability, which is the El Nino events that I talked about. And this is their estimate of the future. It's like a lot of graphs you see in global warming related science. Things are varying and they're gonna get worse. That's what the science shows. It's uncertain, but this is the best available science at the time and it suggests somewhere around one degree of additional warming over the next century in Antarctica, in this part of Antarctica, which clearly affects the, the ice sheet. And of course, this translates to sea level rise and if you follow this stuff at all, you'll know what the IPCC is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which does these assessments every few years, five or six years, and says the best available science is this. And in this particular plot from 2021, they show different scenarios of future sea level rise. And then they say, well, there's this other thing, which is Antarctica, which we don't understand yet, and it's worse. It's bigger sea level rise. I don't know where we are on this graph, but I know that all of the evidence I just presented makes me more, more concerned that we are heading on that dotted line. So somewhere perhaps upwards of one and a half meters of global sea level rise in my children's lifetime. Okay, what about the octopus? Um, this is a Turquette's octopus. They live in Antarctica. And there's a bunch of research that's been done that I've been following for years that everyone in my glaciological community has been ignoring because they don't really like the idea that we're unnecessary, that a bunch of biologists could just solve this problem. Uh, and also because we don't understand biology. But it turns out that this octopus lives on both the Atlantic side up, up on the graph and the Pacific side of Antarctica and they've collected these octopi from around Antarctica and they show that the relationship between the Weddell Sea ones up top and the Amundsen Sea ones down at the bottom is closer than either of them are to the Antarctic Peninsula ones. The only way that this makes sense, they argue, is if those were connected by a seaway in the past. And not only that, but they make an estimate from the genetic clock, you know, the, the rate of mutations that occur, uh, that it was around 100,000 years ago, which is exactly the right time because about 125,000 years ago was the last time the Earth got really warm. Sea level was somewhere between four and possibly nine meters higher than present. And all of us actually firmly believe, despite that we don't really have good evidence, that the West Eric Ice Sheet was gone at the time. This is probably the best evidence yet that that's true. So Antarctica today on the left, Antarctica then on the right, there's a seaway through which the octopi traveled and shared their genetics. That particular image is actually seven and a half meters of sea level rise from Antarctica alone, which I find completely terrifying. I also think it's probably overkill, uh, but the point is this is a very serious issue. How long it will take us to get there? This is not in our lifetimes. This is centuries. But the rate of sea level rise that you need to get to that kind of change over a few centuries, it's fast enough. Well, we're measuring it now, and it's fast enough to make a difference. Don't, if you're rich, buy waterfront property, but up somewhere on a hill <laughs> and invite me to visit. Okay, so I'm almost done and I will look forward to taking questions. Um, summary, the Antarctic Peninsula is melting because the air is warmer, it's simple. This is certainly our fault. There's virtually no question about this. See how conservative I am? Uh, <laughs> most of my colleagues would say, come on, it's, it's our fault. Like, stop beating around the bush. Act two, the Western Arctic Sheet is melting because the winds are pushing more warm water towards the glaciers, that's absolutely true. Is that our fault? Probably the evidence remains, it's an unproven point. This started in the mid 20th century or earlier. And just one side note, you may have heard people say, this is happening because of the ozone hole. Don't believe them. The ozone hole began in the late 70s to early 80s. And the evidence we have that 
the, ex the increased melt in Antarctica happened well before that is very, very strong. This is almost certainly about carbon dioxide. But that's an unpublished point. And finally, Act 4, all the evidence points towards increased melt in the future and perhaps, or I would actually say probably, collapse on some much longer time scale. So the West Antarctic ice sheet is gone. And with that, I just want to acknowledge a few folks. Um, the National Science Foundation, which funds most of our research, and a few key people, former postdocs, grad students of mine, and Paul Holland at the British Antarctic Survey, who I've learned a huge amount from. And that is a beautiful photo of nighttime on Mount Waddington in 2010. And I will stop there. Well, thank you, Eric, for that um, inspiring talk about um, a whole variety of pretty exciting, um, pretty exciting topics. And you know, one thing that struck me a little bit was how you know, the work that you're doing in Antarctica, how transdisciplinary that is. Like it's, it's certainly not something that, that just one person can do on their, uh, on their own. So um, we're gonna open it up to questions now. I know many of you have questions in the audience here as well as online. Um, we're gonna try our best to get to as many questions as we can, but we may not be able to get to everybody. Are we gonna put the phone number up? Oh yeah, there we go. So it, on the screen there, 403-708-5749. Obviously, if you're in the room here, you don't need to text. You can just ask your question. Are you going to go around with a mic? OK, why don't we start, because I don't know if there are online ones yet. Why don't we start with one or two in the room? There's one in the back there. That works. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I'm really interested in the ice cores that you drilled and how far back in time you were able to go. I was just wondering, like, can you go back to, for example, um, the beginning of this interglacial period? So uh, in Greenland, we have ice cores that go back 100,000 years, several of them now, and a little bit further, some of them just slightly capture the last interglacial. In Antarctica, we have five or six that go back fully through the last interglacial, and a few that go back 400, 600, and 880,000 years, um, which is very cool. Uh, even cooler is that there's now a bunch of international groups, including some in the US that I'm involved with, looking for, and we've actually found already, ice over four million years old. So that gets into the Pliocene before the Pleistocene, before the Ice Ages, and is really challenging. And I don't actually believe any of the data we've produced yet, <laughs> uh, because the ice has been sitting there for four million years. Stuff happens to it. Uh, but it's, it's, I was telling a colleague today, it's just really kind of exhilarating having ice in your laboratory that's four million years old. Yeah, I will just add that most of my work all of the work I talked about here is just about the very recent past, which doesn't have that same like sort of spacey, like wow picture, but it's also more directly relevant, of course, to these kind of questions. Thanks. Another question in the room? There's one over here. Oh, in the front there. While, while Annie's walking, I've got, yeah. I have a question about four million year old ice. Yeah. What do you say at the airport, like when they ask what you have to declare? I, I have a story about this. I was We're in, gonna do like a Laurel and Hardy. I, thing. <laughs> I was in Edmonton, don't, are there any police in the audience? Like, like I, I was in Edmonton. This is such a funny story. I was in Edmonton collecting cutting up ice that we had drilled in Mount Waddington because it's being stored with my colleague Ali Cristicello's lab in the University of, Calgary, of, of Alberta in Edmonton. And I didn't want to deal with all the paperwork. So I put all these boxes, hundreds of little uh, plastic bottles with water in them. I just put them in my luggage and of course they stopped me, right, at customs. 
and I go and I'm like, oh, what are they going to make me do? You know, like, and the woman, the customs person, she had a, an accent, a Latina accent. And so I know a little Spanish. I started talking to her. She's from Guatemala. What do you do? Oh, my husband is a paleo oceanographer, she says. <laughs> and I'm like, it's going to be OK. <laughs> and she let me through. Yeah. So that, that's my answer. Question. Uh, Seri more serious question. <laughs> you mentioned that the circumpolar deep water tends to have higher salinity and salt causes the melting point of ice to go up, or it makes it melt easier. So does that affect this melting in any way? Oh, that that's a good question. So um, when I was referring to the salinity of the water, I wasn't talking about the temperature, actually, but just the density. So the ocean is stratified by the buoyancy of the water, right? And warmer water is more buoyant, but salty water is less buoyant. And it's this really subtle thing. You can raise the temperature a bit, and it should rise, but you only have to raise the salinity a bit, and it will sink. And it happens that circumpolar deep water, well, it forms in the North Atlantic because it's very salty. Evaporation in the southern North Atlantic makes that water salty. It travels north, it cools. Now it's salty and cold, sinks down to the bottom travels along the bottom, and it's really cold water, but now it meets water that's even colder, which is Antarctic bottom water, and it rises up above that. Uh, in terms of the melting point of ice, the issue there is actually a pressure one. The ice that I'm talking about melting here is a couple hundred meters uh, above sea level, the floating part, but below that are hundreds of meters of ice down to the bottom. Uh, and so we're talking about depths of four, five, six hundred meters, and that depresses the, the melting point. So it could be below freezing, uh, but two degrees w warm water is actually four degrees above the in-situ melting point. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. We've got a question online. All right, yes. Uh, if you have any questions, please do text them to that number. In the meantime, here's one that we had come in. Wonderful and illuminating talk. Thank you very much. I was wondering if you could touch on the deep ocean currents and if there is any evidence of current reversal or slower velocity happening there. <laughs> I'm laughing because, not because it's a dumb question, it's a really good question. I keep saying this, I'm a conservative. I, I, um, I have disbelieved that stuff for years. I'm like, this is you guys, you oceanographers, I'm not an oceanographer by profession. You're overstating the seriousness of that issue, the idea that the overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean may, may change dramatically and perhaps actually lead to cooling in, uh, in Europe. I still think it's overstated by the media, but I, I have a good friend and colleague, Stefan Romsdorf, who's an oceanographer, who's an expert on this, and he's been berating me for years for not taking this seriously. And the evidence is increasingly good that, yeah, actually, there have been changes to that overturning circulation. And in fact, even though it's warming up most places, it's actually been cooling in the last 40 years or so south of Greenland for exactly this reason, because the ocean circulation is changing. Got one in the back there. I just realized that this is online, so the customs people are going to find me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Canadian citizen, please. <laughs> uh, thank you for a marvelous presentation. Thank you. I'm a big fan of trees. I'm a layperson when it comes to climate. But I have read work by Dr. Silas Rao and others who've said that uh, human impact over the past 10,000 years of our agriculture on the planet has caused trees to go from six trillion in number down to three trillion in the past 10,000 years. So just wondering, anybody, University of Calgary, University of Washington, looking at any correlation between this uh, dramatic crashing in the numbers of trees and uh, climate? I am definitely not a tree expert. I, I will. Note that, um, so, so I'm not going to be able to answer your question directly. Uh, uh, I will note that there is, there, there is an interesting idea that has been presented by a guy named Bill Rudiman that the Anthropocene, the you know, time of 
human influence being global in scale actually started thousands of years ago because of, of early agriculture, et cetera. And I keep saying this, I'm a conservative, so I don't believe it, but it's a really intriguing idea, and I don't know that it's wrong. So certainly our influence may extend much further back in time. I don't know about the tree population in, in particular. We've got one on either end here in the front. I'm coming. It's going to work out. <laughs> Getting in my steps here. Yeah. You mentioned looking for fossils on the beach at the, on, on the Antarctic Peninsula. I'm just wondering what you found and what that told you about the ice there. Um, this was a complete boondoggle trip. Uh, a colleague of mine is a paleontologist. He's actually the, one of the leading uh, authorities on nautiluses, nautili, and ammonites. Ammonites are right these spiral shells that went extinct when the dinosaurs did. And we went to James Ross Island, where that ice core was drilled, and he, he got funding to go there, and he just asked me to come because I'd been to Antarctica before, and I didn't tell him, you don't need me. I was like, yeah, you need me. Or, or, you know, or you'll die in the cold. And, and so we spent six glorious weeks walking around. And it's just, it's really mind boggling because very few people have been there. And therefore, nobody's been picking over the rocks. There's fossils just everywhere. You, you, you would trip over an ammonite fossil. And so it was mostly a study of ammonites. Some colleagues of his found a dinosaur uh, skeleton there that we probably walked right over but didn't notice, because that's not what we do. Yeah. So that research had nothing to do with, with this in particular. Yeah, it was just a great opportunity. We've got another one online. Yes, indeed. So a uh, question in from online. This was an amazing talk. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, with the octopi, uh, the proof of the presence of the sea channel in the peninsula and the genetic evidence. but. Uh, isn't it possible that the octopi just traveled around the peninsula itself? Uh, it doesn't appear as though it might be that different from traveling through the sea channel based on the map. Uh, could you elaborate on that? No. <laughs> no I, that is addressed very directly in the paper. That's actually a critical point in the paper, that they claim they can demonstrate that it was not going around. And again, I'm not a biologist, and I'm certainly not a geneticist, but I think the idea is that well, I know the idea is that the similarities are less among the going around route than they are in the across route. So they're, they're pretty confident about it. I, I'll just add that that group has published papers quite a few times over the years. And they were all published in relatively obscure journals because they didn't have the nail in the coffin sort of evidence. This new paper was published in Science, which is hard to get into unless you're really sure. So this appears to be a major change. I'm actually meeting with the lead author next week to ask her these questions. So if you want to email me and ask me what I've learned afterwards, feel free to do that. Was there one, still a question over on this side? OK. Any other question? Oh, we got one in the middle. I think henceforth. All of our EarthX talks, I guess, need to have a cameo from an octopus. It'll be yeah, yeah, yeah. I like part that. Part of the contract. <laughs> Thank you so much for the excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, this is more of an interdisciplinary question, but I'm just curious about the the warming of of the air um, in terms of composition in this warming air and how it implies to well, first of all the melting of the Antarctic, but also how it affects global health. Like for instance, I am from the Faculty of Medicine, and so we see a lot of younger and younger patients coming in presenting with stage four, stage five cancer. Uh, they self-report that they have never smoked, they uh, haven't been drinking a lot. So it's kind of interesting to know um, if you've ever looked into the composition of the ice in terms of the last maybe 50 years or so to see if there are any chemicals or molecules that might be more harmful. Like for instance, there were research about microplastics that seems to have made its way to Antarctica, unfortunately. unfortunately. So I'm just curious to know if you've done any, any research. Um, I think one of the... Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, that's a great question. What I mean, obviously, I'm not a medical health expert, but one of the amazing things about ice cores is that 
people keep coming up with new things they can analyze. I mean, it's, it's the most wonderful laboratory because it's really, really pure water with a little bit of chemistry in it. And that chemistry has gotten there through the air. And one study that I was involved in many, many years ago actually looked at the concentrations of PCBs in the Arctic. Many of you may know this, but there's this problem that uh, PCBs, you know, from batteries and uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's, it's used in electrical, electrical insulator and generators, et cetera. Uh, those chemicals um, degrade at warm temperatures, but slowly, and they sort of hopscotch their way. It's actually called the grasshopper effect. They get into the atmosphere, they get rained out, they get into the atmosphere again, and they make their way up to the Arctic. And then it's cold enough that they persist. And then fish eat them, and the seals eat the fish, and the polar bears eat the seals, and humans eat the polar bear meat. And the concentration of PCBs in Inuit people is the highest anywhere on Earth because of this. And so the relevance to ice cores is that you can actually see for how long has that been happening, and what's the rate of change. And unfortunately, the answer is it's, you know, it's continually increased through time, because even though there's more regulation, we're also just doing more things, and there's more of those chemicals. And I could give you many other examples. Um, maybe a little less depressing one is that lead concentrations, this is actually great, lead concentrations in Greenland and at Mount Waddington in British Columbia have exactly the same history. And you can see it's going up and up and up and up, and then in 1970-ish, it drops because of the Clean Air Act and the fact that we stopped using leaded gasoline. And it's just this beautiful example of we can change our ways and you can see the impacts in history. I think we've got uh, one more online question and then maybe we've got time for one more uh, from, from in the house here. All right, a question in from online. Could you please explain in a little bit more detail the connection between the winds and the ocean temperatures? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't really have the right graphics for this, but. Uh, Do it as a dance. OK. <laughs> I, I have a friend who um, is a glaciologist who was on a ship with Ted Turner, invited the invited scientists with a bunch of wealthy people. They went to Antarctica, and he actually got these guys doing a dance. Explain, you know, you be the warm water and Ted Turner is the wind and it sounded very silly. Um, so the simplest way to explain this, which is not really quite what's going on, but gives you a sense of things. Um, maybe a good example is actually to think about California. So there's a coastal current in California that uh, travels along, southward along the coast, and there's upwelling of water. Uh, it's a productive place, like dive, scuba divers love to go to Monterey because of all the productivity because of the upwelling water. The reason that water is upwelling is because of the Coriolis effect. If the winds are pushing the water this way and the currents are moving that way at the surface, the water on top is pushing on the water below, and then in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect pushes the water below it to the right, and that pushes the water below that to the right. So winds along coastlines drive offshore transport and upwelling. And it's exactly the same thing in Antarctica. The circumpolar westerlies are cruising around Antarctica, and in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect is to the left. And so that's driving water off away from Antarctica. Something has to replace it. Warm water comes up from below. It turns out that that explanation is super elegant and works really well and gives you the right answer and is probably not really in detail what's going on because there's all kinds of eddies happening in the ocean. I'll just add one more thing to try to give a sense of this. Everyone knows what a storm is like, right? Uh, um, turbulent behavior in the atmosphere. Uh, this is called baroclinic instability. It occurs in the ocean as well. As currents increase in speed, you can reach a point where they're unstable and they start mixing around in crazy ways. And that actually is probably the mechanism that's getting this warm water up onto the ice shelves, uh, uh, onto the continental shelf. Maybe one more in the middle there. And so while Annie is walking, inquiring minds want to know what four million year old ice tastes like. 
Uh, probably very similar to recent ice, except it's got nasty chemicals in it that were used in the drilling process. Mm. So we don't drink it. Um, so with the warm and water at the bottom of the ice shelf in Antarctica, is there anything similar happening, say, in northern Canada or around Greenland? I'm super embarrassed to say that I'm actually not sure about the northern Canada question, because I'm embarrassingly unfamiliar with the details. Greenland, however, yes. Uh, it's similar in many ways. The major difference is that Greenland uh, the, the ice that's flowing off the Greenland ice sheet is flowing into deep fjords, not into sort of a, a larger open bay like in most of Antarctica. And so then you get into some details of fjord circulation, which are, it's just a different beast and it's fairly complicated. Or it's not so much that it's complicated, it's actually well understood, but it's different than in Antarctica. But it is the same high level thing. There's warm water that gets brought in by wind and current mixing. And, and for sure is, change, is, is part of the reason that coastal glaciers in Greenland are melting. Greenland, however, is more driven by just it's warm on the surface. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we're going to have one last question from online. All right, thanks very much. If anybody else has any other online questions, uh, by all means, you can still text them in. What we'll do is aim to get you an answer by uh, text or email following up here. But our last question coming in is amazing lecture. Thank you. Uh, are you able to discriminate between ice layers influenced by short-term variations versus long-term cyclicity due to the Milankovitch cycles? You might have to explain a little bit what that That's is. That's great. Um, I could go on forever about this. Uh, no, really. The Milankovitch theory, how many people know what the Milankovitch theory is? OK. so. Basically, the idea is that the Earth's going around the sun, obviously. Um, the Earth is tilted by 23 and a half degrees or so. And summer in the northern hemisphere occurs when it does, because that's when the Earth's northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun, and the southern hemisphere is pointed away. So it's winter there. Here's the sun. Here's the Earth. It's going around like this, and over tens of thousands of years, that axis is wobbling. So the timing of the seasons, also the distance at a particular season between the Earth and the Sun changes, and how circular the orbit changes. Those three things combine to give you the Milankovitch cycles, changes in the distribution of sunlight through time at the Earth's surface. That theory explains the ice ages, explains the ups and downs of ice ages on 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 100,000 year time scales. Um, the really critical proof that this was right came from ocean sediment cores in the 70s. And what I always want to say about this is those people should have gotten the Nobel Prize. I mean, it is a gorgeous piece of science. It's like classic science. You make a prediction based on physics. You go out and test something, and you show the prediction is right. It's just fantastic. So where did the ice cores come in? They added a few critical points to this, one of which is the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere also follow the Milankovitch cycles. Major discovery. Those guys should have got the Nobel Prize. And I was devastated with Jean-Marc Bernola, who published one of the most, the first really fantastic records from the Vostok Ice Core, 400,000 years of climate history, who died just a few years ago. And I had been hearing talk about him being nominated for the Nobel Prize. It makes me sad. So that's my answer about Milankovitch. Well. I think that uh, draws our questions to a close. So let's give Eric a big round of applause. Thank you very much for coming out. I, I really enjoyed answering your questions. And you guys are so nice with the compliments. Thank you. So um, before everybody leaves, um, I'd like to remind you to take an exit survey, which is going to be in your inbox um, tomorrow. We value your feedback. We want to make the EarthX series uh, the best it possibly can be. Um, also, we are still in the process of working on the details for our next EarthX talk, so keep your eyes on your email for that. Also on the um, Department of Earth Energy and Environment uh, website. And it, um, 
for, for details of the, uh, of the next talk. So again, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you later. Thanks again.